week's government event on localising net zero and how governments can approach uh, decarbonising homes. Uh, my name is Tom Sass, I'm <coughs> Associate Director at the Institute for Government. I lead our work on net zero. Um, so homes are sort of emerging as one of the trickiest areas of the net zero uh, transition. We are eagerly awaiting a heat and building strategy. I think Lord Callanan's going to uh, give us an update on, on that. Um, the there's secret in inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's increasing chatter about, you know, cost of replacing boilers, the disruption, how we get this transition right. You will all have noticed just the sheer number of events at this conference on decarbonising homes. Um, it's really becoming one of the critical issues. Um, we've got, at the moment, sort of issues with incentives for consumers around sort of switching from uh, sort of boilers towards uh, low carbon solutions. We've also seen <coughs> some questions thrown up at the moment because of a, a gas price um, squeeze. Uh, there's the question of the cost of the technology, how affordable that's going to be for a wide uh, range of people. And then, of course, there's the focus of this session, which is um, the role that local areas have in delivering all of this. Um, you know, local authorities, they all have very different housing stocks, different local populations, different supply chains. Um, so I think a lot of the thinking now is around actually local areas need to have a critical role in driving this. Um, so it's going to be a difficult transition to get right, but an absolutely critical one for net zero. So what does government need to do? How can we enable that? That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we've got a fantastic panel to do that. So Lord Callanan is Minister for Business, Energy and Corporate Responsibility in uh, BASE, that's the business department, and previously served in the now abolished DEXU um, and the Department for Transport uh, and has a background as an engineer. Uh, Laura Sands is a, a leading thinker on energy issues related to net zero. She's the chair of the Energy Digitalization Task Force, co-chair <coughs> of the IPPR Environmental Justice Commission, um, and NED at the Energy Systems Catapult. We do a lot of interesting work in this area. And she was the MP for South Thanet in the 2010-15 to 15 Parliament. Uh, Councillor Dan Watkins is the Deputy Cabinet Member for Highways and Transport at Kent County Council and is also a councillor at Canterbury, Council, Canterbury City Council, uh, as well as being a patron of Tories for Climate Action uh, and active on conservation of green space. Josh Clark, uh, we've promoted today to Director of External Affairs at SGN. Uh, he's worked across policy and business development roles covering South America, the UK, US and Europe in electricity, telecoms and gas infrastructure uh, throughout his career. Um, so I'm going to start off asking a few questions of my panel, um, having a bit of discussion, and then we'll have at least sort of 25 minutes or so for questions from you. Um, we'll be live tweeting this at ifgcons21. If you would like to tweet along, please do that. Uh, the event is being recorded and it is on the record. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms. If we do have one penning at the back, we'll tell you what to do. Uh, and we're aiming to wrap up by about 4.45. And just lastly, we're very grateful to SGN uh, for sponsoring this event. Um, so, Lord Callan, I'm going to come to you first. Thank you very much for rushing over from uh, your last event. What is the government's approach to decarbonising homes? Uh, we think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, brief summary. Right. Um, so, we've, uh, so far in this country, we've been successful at, uh, at decarbonisation in the power sector, and in fact, we are in terms of energy emissions reductions, we're one of the most uh, advanced countries in the developed world, or you, you wouldn't think that, uh, given some of the demonstrations that we see in, uh, in and around London at the moment. Um, and that's largely been done uh, by uh, wind power, particularly offshore wind power. It's been hugely successful, um, cost massively coming down now, uh, but of course there are still some legacy costs that we're bearing on electricity bills uh, paying for that. So that's been very successful, and we've, uh, we've, we've reduced our carbon footprint massively and managed to do it in a growing economy. But the challenge that we're now coming on to, which is decarbonizing heat and buildings, is of a vastly different scale. So we're talking about roughly 28 million buildings uh, in the UK, give or take a million or two, which is responsible for 30% of all of our emissions, mostly from uh, heat. Um, how much is it going to cost? Um, I think people put their finger in the air and come up with numbers. I think the Climate Change Committee estimated you were talking about 250 billion. Uh, now, obviously, this is not one-off cost. This is spread over uh, decades. But nevertheless, 
uh, as Ronald Reagan said, you know, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking real money. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very expensive. So the key political debate is really about um, how we do it and ultimately who pays. And the government's approach is uh, under underpinned by a number of uh, principles. Um, the first one is uh, fabric first, uh, in that there are a range of possible solutions for uh, decarbonizing heating, and we can go to talk about those uh, if you want to, Chairman. But you know, in any in any uh, situation, improving uh, the UK's the fabric of, uh, of the UK's building stock is an altogether good thing to do. We use uh, less energy; homes become warmer and more efficient, um, and uh, we are trying to, to do that and incentivize it in a number of different ways, uh, and mainly targeted towards um, those who are on lower incomes, um, who can't afford the transition. Um, in terms of heating technologies, three basic options. Um, my apologies to those who just heard me talk about a similar thing in a previous fringe, but uh, we are looking at um, electrification of heat through the likes of uh, heat pumps, uh, we're looking at the potential for hydrogen, um, very trendy and popular subject. But we published a hydrogen strategy recently. Our approach to hydrogen is pretty much let's wait and see. We have set a target for the production of five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by the end of the decade. And we shortly be consulting on a price support mechanism to try and incentivize that. Um, I think my guess at the moment is that hydrogen would be more suitable for uh, industrial decarbonization, you know, steel sector, for instance, cement sector, uh, trains, buses, um, HGVs. Unless, of course, technology comes to our rescue, costs come down massively, and uh, we find ways of producing large quantities uh, of hydrogen that can be fed into the mains uh, gas network. And, and you can use up to 20% hydrogen in the ne gas network at the moment without the consumer noticing any difference. Uh, and uh, through our High for Heat program, we're supporting the development of quite an exciting range of hydrogen appliances. So there are two houses which you can go and visit in uh, Gateshead at the moment, which are powered entirely by, by hydrogen. They have hydrogen boilers, they have hydrogen hobs, they have hydrogen uh, uh, fires as well, and it all works perfectly. The problem, of course, is where you get the hydrogen from in the first place. Um, there'll be a mix of different strategies, no, no silver bullet silver buckshots, uh, as was said. Um, what is appropriate for an NHS hospital or an office block is going to be entirely different to, to what is uh, appropriate for small inner city flats where things like heat networks will play a much uh, a much bigger role. So um, our approach is, is to support a number of different uh, technologies. So we're rolling out Clean Heat Grant uh, uh, April next year, which will be a uh, straight upfront grant payment for uh, low carbon heating, uh, principally ground and air source heat pumps and a small amount of uh, biomass uh, boilers. Um, and we're, I should say in the context of this meeting, working very closely with a number of local authorities uh, through waves of funding, through uh, supporting uh, social housing, through the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. We have a uh, uh, manifesto commitment of 3.8 billion uh, to, to the SHDF over, over 10 years and we've uh, we've done the demonstrator funding for that and we're currently assessing the bids for for the latest round of that funding um, I used to be a local councillor myself so I'm a great believer in uh, not sitting in government trying to dictate everything across the country local authorities know their areas very well where we can work with local authorities we will do so um, under the, the, the stimulus packages, the famous Green Home Grant uh, voucher system, which was very far from being our finest hour. What everybody's forgotten is that the other half of that funding, uh, something called the Local Authority Delivery Mechanism, we've, uh, we've rolled out uh, something like 500 million pounds through local authorities, very successfully delivering uh, decarbonization insulation schemes for some of the uh, poorest people in the country. Uh, a fact that seems to have escaped our insulated Britain demonstrators gluing themselves to the road, claiming we're not doing anything on it. And that scheme's going very well, and we're just about to announce a further £300 million worth of funding to another wave of local authorities to, to do that. All about building production capacity, building the supply capacity, building the installer base, uh, and working in close partnership with, with local authorities to do that. 
Uh, we will also do the same with the next round of social housing decarbonisation fund as well, uh, working with housing associations through their individual local authorities. And then the next round of that, we will open up funding opportunities directly to housing associations uh, as well. So there's a lot more I could say on this, but perhaps if I stop there, and maybe some more points will come out during uh, questions. That's a brilliant start. And just one point I wanted to pick up was just on the, the financing of this and the role of public finance. And I know we're going to see much more of this in the heat and building strategy, and you mm. won't want to mm. reveal what's going to be in that. But we have a spending review, you know, approaching. But you won't um, get amounts of money in the heat and building strategy. <laughs> before you, have to. Um, you know, we've got a spending review coming. We've got you've mentioned there some of the different pots that are available for sort mm. of innovation and different, you know, different types of tenure. Do we need a sort of bigger scale of public investment just to get this moving at the speed that we're talking about? Is that kind of going to be a core part of the new public growth? I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm in a spending department. You know, I, um, I have to run a lot of these grant schemes. I, we, are, we are spending a lot of money in this area. Would I like to spend more? Of course. And, you know, but you know, the Chancellor has the most difficult job in government because he's got lots of us all giving him excellent bids for <laughs> ways to spend money. He doesn't have as many contributions as people about how he could either save or raise the money. That's the hard. That's the hard bit of politics. Is uh, anybody can spend it? <laughs> well, it's hard spending it. But anyway, anybody can spend it. Raising it is is the tricky political bit. And uh, I don't envy, envy the chancellor his job. So um, if I just say that I think we as a department have put in some excellent spending bids in the spending <laughs> review, and we will wait to see the, the outcome of that. Very good. Thank you, um, Laura. I'm going to come to you next um so we were talking actually just before the panel about the kind of consumer mm -hmm. angle of this yeah. and the fact that actually one of the most difficult things is getting the consumer proposition to a point where actually lots of people want to make these changes so take us into that fantastic and thank you martin it's really <laughs> exciting i think this conference is quite amazing in many ways i mean the amount of fringes around green cop um, and very much focusing on heating because this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of the distribution and deployment <coughs> challenge um, that we have. We've been able to do the big stuff and now it's the mini stuff which actually is very, very difficult to do from the point of view of sitting in Victoria Street or sitting even in a sort of, sort of county council. So in many ways, I think we've got to look at business models and we've got to start looking at what actually can be deployed by great new, in many ways, energy propositions. But let, let me just start by talking about what I think are the key guiding principles from a consumer's perspective. Firstly, as Martin rightly says, it will be a mixed heat economy, so it will all be down to location, location, mm. location, housing stock, and one important factor, which is ownership. So we talk about housing associations, but the privately rented sector. So there is going to be both choice and appropriateness. The second is about the experience that the consumer has. And so the heat experience, and actually to be frank, the cooling experience, which we're going to have to start to accommodate, needs to be something that A, consumers um, enjoy, recognize, and actually has some form of service agreement around it. Because to be mm. frank, if somebody starts putting this kit in, and it stops working, right? I, I don't want to just be left with a heat pump operator who's now moved into a different part of yeah. uh, the country. So this element is going to be really, really important to build trust. Um, and the third point is affordability. And we, as you rightly say, we've got lots of different options and everything will need to be zoned around different parts of the country. Um, I actually really like some of the hydrogen um, trajectories because in some ways it's a bit like a hockey stick nothing goes on for quite a long time and then suddenly there is a, a, a in many <coughs> ways a much greater mass rollout rather than in some ways the more distributed heat pump scenario but let's look at affordability so the um, energy system operator says that it will have to balance the electricity system by um, as more by demand than supply by 2027 2028 that means that these assets in everyone's home are of huge value to the overall system. The problem is the money does not flow to consumers for their actions that they are paying to contribute. So I think we can move money much more effectively through the system and reward customers for change. Um, I also think that 
for me to spend 20 grand, right, which is a refurb for my home and, and, and also a heat pump, I think that's 80% of the population are going to find that a big ask. So could we not be looking at mini CFDs? Because for me, it's as big an ask as it is for Orsted to put an offshore wind farm. Equivalent. And I think there is ways of actually miniaturizing some of the support mechanisms that we already have. So I think that there is a way forward, but it is going to be a lot more complicated. I would hope <coughs> that we can start, and particularly with our retail market, um, a little bit of a sort of the meltdown in the last couple of months, um, that actually we could start moving to energy as a service in its entirety and actually take this complexity away from consumers, provide them with capital assets over an amortized period where actually a lot of the service agreements and consumer protection can be embedded. I think we really need to rethink that retail experience. Just on, on the affordability point, and you mentioned the sort of offshore wind yep. uh, example, you know, some of the companies, Oxfus Energy, sort of talking about getting the cost per heat pump <coughs> down from sort of 10,000 to 5,000 in a couple of years. Do you think that sort of trajectory is actually is, is possible if we get the, the incentives and the frameworks I'm, right? I'm, I'm sure scale absolutely drives price down. Mm. Um, however, there is the huge cost per home to actually deploy it. So you can get actually the kit down, but the actual intervention is still going to be quite expensive. Mm. And I don't see why in many ways, I, I actually don't have the five grand either. Never mind the 20 <laughs> grand. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know how many people have got it, so hanging around with it's ready and waiting. Yeah. So actually, you, buy, you don't buy a car, I and mean, very few people buy cars outright. Yeah. Very few people buy any of these capital assets outright. But actually, more importantly for me, is I want to have the service agreement where they come and they mend it mm. when the heat pump goes wrong. And actually, I think the service proposition really helps unlock both of those. Yeah, yeah. and of course, one of the big things which we're hearing about is, is moving some of the policy costs from gas to elec um, sorry from electricity to gas which is going to help with the incentives to do that um, Dan I wonder if I can uh, bring you in so Lord Callanan sort of set out a bit there central government's approach to this but also seeing a, a really big role for local areas in, in driving this can you tell us about the approach you're taking in your sort of in your council and, and what local authorities are actually looking for to, to drive this change Absolutely. Uh, happy to do so, Tom. Before I do that, actually, I'll just, I'll just ask, um, how many people here have been a councillor or are a councillor? Fantastic. And uh, how many people know where Herne Bay is? Way. That is <laughs> mighty fine. Thank you. We're on the other side of the country. That's where I represent. And um, uh, it's a Victorian seaside town. And in the 1800s, it claimed to be the healthiest town in Britain, which was a frankly outrageous uh, proposition. To, to strap to itself, but um, I like to say uh, today that Herne Bay has the cleanest energy in the country. We have um, an offshore wind farm, uh, we have uh, two large solar farms and a third one going in, and next year we'll start building a large green hydrogen plant. Um, and yeah, that is all helping to decarbonize um, the central electricity grid and also transport. But maybe where things are really tough is what I'll talk to you about now is, is on the housing side, and I'll, I'll go through a few of the things that we're doing um, and a few of the kind of obstacles we're, we're finding as a council as we, as we, we, we try to, to decarbonise homes. So as, as uh, Canterbury City Council, our two main um, tools to, 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 to reduce um, carbon in homes are the planning system for, for private homes and then, and then for um, the social housing we run directly. Um, we um, are, are trying to uh, really lead the way as a, as a district in Kent in our new local plan that we're creating. Um, it's just gone out to consultation. It's got a zero carbon target in there for uh, the new development, and this will be you know 10,000 plus homes uh, in our in our district. Um, there will be uh, for the developers who can't make a site zero carbon, we will allow them to pay a carbon levy to offset the residual emissions and that that's quite a common model for cities and city um, you know local government and and now we're trying to do it in a more rural um, coastal community and I, I hope that that will make it all its way through to the inspector and get fully signed off but uh, we shall we shall see um, but that clearly will have 
a, a big a big impact on what we call operational emissions. So you know the, the carbon from uh, heating and lighting in the homes. Um, but I, I hadn't been aware until I, I came into this role that actually half of all of the life cycle carbon for a new home is is in building it. You know, mm. particularly the concrete and the bricks, which are really energy intensive to manufacture. Um, and then the operational emissions, the lighting and the heating, are the other half over the 50 year lifespan of the, the home. So um, that's, a, that's a, a challenge for local government. I think um, even the most advanced local authorities haven't yet got net zero for what, what we call embodied carbon. You know, that, that's to come and we're gonna try and work with Reba and RICS who've now produced some energy efficiency standards uh, and that, that, that would be fantastic if we can get there. Otherwise, we're only really sort of fighting the battle um, you know, with one arm because we have to, we have to rid the whole system of, of, of carbon. Um, we, we're trying to work with the supply chain. Um, we had a conference last week with a dozen local developers in, who, who build in the Canterbury area. Um, some small, some large. I would say that, that the feedback uh, was that the smaller developers are really signed up for the green agenda because they can only deliver so many homes. Um, the larger ones who can build huge numbers of homes, and we have the, the likes and suspects, you know, Red Row, Bellway, et cetera, in our district, they, they want to continue really with their existing business model as long as they possibly can. And that existing business model is not changing the supply chain as, as much as it needs to change. So they're slowly greening, but it's, it is very slow. And, and, and that you know, is something that um, I think uh, you know, clearly both central <coughs> and local government need, need, need to work with those supply chains to, to, to get them onto the same place as, as we are. Um, our local enterprise partnership, they are trying to help build construction skills that are greener. Um, all, all the things that um, the minister's been talking about, making sure you know the people who normally come round and, and, and fix a gas boiler now come round and, and, and fix a heat pump, right? and, and, and that's a, that's the, the skills and training piece is absolutely yeah. massive, absolutely massive. Um, so I think you know that's that's a little bit about kind of new homes and some of the things we're we're, we're trying to trying to do. Um, then you've got the re retrofit part, which is the bigger part. I, su I suppose you know that's that's got to be eighty to ninety percent of the private housing stock actually isn't going to be built in the next thirty years. It, it, so we've got to do something with all those homes. Um, I put in a heat pump at my house. I sort of thought you know I need, probably need to lead lead from the front on all of this. Um, and it is such a painful process. It's only because I'm a, a, an energy nerd these days that I, I kind of really went through it. I had to assemble all the different parts. The customer service I got from the engineers who came around to do the heat pump was, was, was pretty ropey at times, although they did a great job on just the engineering job itself. And to, you know, to um, George's point, we, yeah, we, we, we need these, this sort of service, energy as a service proposition. We need a consumer wrap around it, or it's just too invasive, too difficult, I think, for most, most ordinary people to go through with. Having, having been through that, a couple of points I would make um, on planning is just some micro things we could make better to make more people want to have, say, a, a, a heat pump. Um, at the moment, if you put a heat pump within a meter of the boundary of your house, you have to get full planning permission. Now, that is, that is quite an obstacle. Um, and now the latest generation of, uh, of heat pumps, I'm glad to say I bought one from Mitsubishi, which is, which is called an EcoDan. I was obviously very sold on that, that product name. Um, and they're manufactured in Scotland, which is, which is fantastic. And they're so, they're so quiet. Um, and, that, and, that, and that is the new generation. So, so why don't we change the, the planning laws? Because it's, it's just not a problem for my neighbor. But I had to spend what, two, 200 pounds for the planning fee and go through that painful process. Um, so I wonder if, if the government can help us a little bit with just relaxing those rules, because most people would put a heat pump within a meter of their neighbor's property. You have to have quite a big piece of land. If you, if you think about how, how large a, a side passage is, given that a heat pump is about that, that wide itself, and then another weak meter, these little things will, will help because we don't want too many obstacles um, for the consumers, or indeed if energy supply companies come in and start offering these propositions, they don't want to be doing planning permissions on behalf of consumers. That's the last thing they want to do. So we need to make that a little bit easier. And then my final point would just be on the on the on the social housing side. Um, that is really hard graft for for Canterbury. We, our housing revenue account, uh, yeah, it doesn't have a lot of spare funds in it. Um, so um, that is that is tricky. We have to put the money we have got into cladding. So um, we're not doing much more at the moment than just a couple of pilots on sort of oldish buildings, which we're going to do deep retrofit on. 
just to learn a bit, um, build up some skills in house. But um, you know, we need we need to do not a hundred, but maybe even a thousand times faster than that. We're so far away mm. on our own housing stock. Um, we've got one maintenance officer uh, at Canterbury who looks after thousands of homes and, and, and coordinates all of the repairs. Um, that one person plus one climate change officer, they are meant to write the bids for the central government funds. So we, we, have, uh, we, are, we will benefit from that, um, uh, the Green Homes Grant, the good bit, the, the public sector version of that is, is, is fantastic. We haven't got started yet on that, but we will get some money from that. So that's very welcome and, and, and thank you. Um, and we're going to bid for the social housing decarbonisation fund as well. So there are pots of money out there, but I suppose I would say the challenge for us and all local authorities, it's the same with Kent, is when these pots of money come out, if your officers, if you don't have much officer time to write the bids, then sometimes you don't get around to doing it. I wonder if we really want to turbocharge our efforts to retrofit social housing, which has some of our most energy poor uh, residents living in it. Maybe it's time just to, to, to give a grant to local authorities or make it an application which isn't competitive but a simple application so that we can just bite off the, the, the easiest properties because we've got we've got a list you know we know the easiest properties to do but to go through the full application process is, is tricky so I would say they're, they're some of our experiences from the front line that's brilliant and a really interesting point on the grant process piece which I'd like to, to pick up just on the point about um, retrofit and your sort of experience as mm. an energy sort of geek who's, who's gone for this probably not the sort of thing that you would expect a large number of your sort of constituents necessarily to want to do at this point, particularly if we're thinking about owner-occupied housing. Um, have you got a kind of long-term plan where you kind of see, you know, we scale this up a bit in social housing, we get the sort of bit cheaper, more streamlined, and then actually the owner-occupied stuff will come a bit later and you can start to sort of scale that up a bit, or are you just not even at yet sort of thinking about the sort of numbers and the trajectory? Yeah, we, we, I mean, I think the, the more strategic thing we have done on Kent County Council is a scheme called Solar Together, which is a, a group buying solar panel scheme, which, which any resident in Kent could, could uh, engage with. Uh, and that, that was reasonably effective at getting, you know, uh, a few hundred people um, solar panels. Um, but yeah, we're quite early days, so that more advanced thinking we, 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 we haven't done yet. I think, I think you just have to recognise as local government the capability to do complex energy strategies and delivery projects is, is relatively limited. But we know, we know the housing, the stock, the people. Um, we are part of the solution, but, but, but at the moment we're not as well equipped as we could be. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, Joss, um, what are energy networks <coughs> like SGN um, doing to help decarbonise energy? And of course, Laura's mentioned this a bit, but your networks have a really key role in this, don't they? And sort of need to be linked up with thinking in terms of government and local government. Too. Yeah, ab absolutely. So. Um, SGN, for those that don't know, is uh, we we operate in, in the south of England, in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and distribute gas to about six uh, six million customers. So I guess there's there's I'll sort of frame it as a short term thing and, and longer term plans that we're, we're we're putting together. Some of the short term actions are um, getting biomethane into the system to start decarbonising Kent now. Um, now there's a, there's a sort of natural ceiling on biomethane and how much it can put into the in the UK, we, we've got plans for about half a million um, across our networks by the middle of the decade, and I think more broadly in the gas industry, we're probably looking at about around about a million. Uh, but we've probably got another 25 ish to, to go on, on, on top of that. Um, you know, heat networks are going to play a kind of key role, and we've, we've recently entered into a uh, partnership with, with uh, Vital Energy to kind of decarbonize homes through, through, through heat, heat networks. I think part of the kind of critical mass, though. Is going to be how do we kind of tackle those those interconnected heat properties? Uh, clearly, heat pumps have got a massive role to play in that, and it's great that we've got, we've got a target out there, and we've got to work out how to get after that. Um, we're working closely uh, across the industry with HSE and with, uh, with with government to effectively provide the evidence that we can put forward a plan around uh, decarbonising through hydrogen and, and sort of pumps on the network. So that really is about kind of building a, a, an evidence base that answers all the really kind of the significant questions around can we do, can we put hydrogen into the network, is it safe, can we get it into customers' homes, what do the customers think of that, will they accept it, will, they, will boilers run on it, can we cook on it, all those kind of really fundamental questions. So that is a kind of huge body of work that we've got kind of underway and leads into you know, a, a number of trial projects supported by, by Bayes and, and Ofgem which have become um, 
So, so I think we mentioned Pina and iDeploy and, and one or two projects that S Journey is going to be on in its project called A Journey for Five, mm -hmm. uh, which is looking to um, distribute, produce and distribute 100% green hydrogen to, to 300 homes in, in, in five. So that project's underway. We recently announced um, uh, an electrolyzer uh, purchase uh, a couple of weeks back, and, and, and we're going to be supplying that, uh, that, that area um, in, in about 2023. 20, uh, so, so lots in terms of technology happening. I think, I think where this sort of debate kind of plays in as well is around, you know, not, not just sort of resting there with the technology piece, but actually how do we start to think about the plans for deployment here? And, 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 and where we've sort of seen a kind of big challenge is, is marrying national level targets and actually from our business in Scotland, the, the, the Scottish government targets with, with actually delivery and deployment on, on the ground. And that's really where I think the local, local authorities we need to kind of sort of flexibly work out how that how that sort of works, not just from a domestic heat decarbonisation perspective, but actually looking across the whole system. Uh, you know, hydrogen may play a role in, in, in delivery of heat, industrial heat and transport. There's a big interaction there with electrification of heat, <coughs> of transport, and, and, and the more power, the more green power we're going to need as well. And really, our view is we've got to kind of start to work at the local level to build these whole system plans across gas and electricity and, and with the local authority. That, I think, then can kind of lead to you know, really working with, uh, with people like Ken and Canterbury to kind of understand what they want on the ground and, and, and what the homes are like there, what the transport requirements are like there, and, and kind of playing into that space. So that whole system piece, we're kind of already underway. Uh, we started that in, in April of this year, having had it approved by, by Ofgem in our, in our, our business plan. For, for the next five years and, and, and hopefully that will kind of marry through for the, for the, for the next few years. I just wanted to ask you a, a question about coordination because that's a big focus of ours at IFG is looking at mm. particularly with these complex transitions. We've got an energy system which is transitioning and then you've got the changes in people's homes and buildings and you've got the role central government is playing but also in lo local areas we need to play that role too. Yeah. Do you feel like this plan at the moment is joined up in the way it needs to be for organisations like yours to be actually able to understand what you need to do when in quite specific terms? Uh, I, I don't think so, but I think that's part of our role to sort of help help join that up. Actually, um, you know, we've seen uh, across the southeast. Um, you know, we run we go from I guess sort of south of the river, south of the River Thames, up towards Kent and then out towards Crewe and Dorset. There are there are lots of there's lots of activity happening. Um, that there's not actually a heat map where you can say, well, what's, what's, what's that view look like across the whole of that regional area? And, you know, we've sort of looked and said, well, actually, SGN are probably one of the only organisations that, that has the capability to on the, on the week to, to, to see that. So we think we've really got a kind of a, a role in that space. In, in Scotland, I think actually um, it's a slightly different, there's a different nuance there in Northern Ireland as well, because you have... Uh, you know, and you've left behind the big four of, of government there. And I think uh, you know, that is something that I think can be leveraged certainly in Scotland, probably Wales and Northern Ireland as well. How we do that for the, the kind of the massive of, of England, I think is a really sort of interesting question to kind of work through. <coughs> is that something central government do, local government, or, or how do we kind of sort of fit that together? Yeah, no, we've sure. been thinking a bit about whether the, you almost need a layer between yeah. to do some of that coordination at that level. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to questions from you. So, Lord Callan, I just wanted an, a little bit more on skills. Um, you talked Ooh. quite sort of candidly, actually, about uh, at one of our previous events about some of the issues with the Green Homes Grant and the sort of short-term nature of that and so on. Um, what do you think is, is sort of needed to actually build this skills workforce that we're talking about in terms of, you know, programmes from government but, but other things too? <coughs> well, certainly programmes for, for government and, um, you know, led by the GFE, we have a big skills uh, agenda, spending two and a half billion uh, this year, including skills for uh, low carbon installations. Um, we gave grants of, I think it was about, nine million uh in the green homes grant for um for a whole series of, of tailored training packages which are being rolled out uh, now but also there's, there's there's some really good innovation going on in the private sector as well um you know you mentioned octopus earlier they they're opening a, a huge new training center in slough um i went to open a training center in east london for uh, dakin um last week um, which is relatively small scale, and they're rolling out twenty or thirty across the whole of the across the whole of the u 
UK, just little um, warehouse units uh, run by a dedicated team where um, plumbers, fitters, etc., can come in, can see the technology, can see it working in action, can get the technical specifications, can do a sit down training course as to how the installations work. Um, or obviously working closely with the MCS as well, the trade body, to help to, to roll out more more training courses. And I think they, they can do a conversion course for existing qualified gas engineers in about seven days mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. qualify them with the new technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <coughs> okay, who's got a question? Uh, I'll take one here mm-hmm. and one at the front and one at the back there. You say who you are and, and why you're Thank here. Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Carey. I'm with Kent County Council and I, I'm responsible for environment. Uh, Dan has made the very good point about uh, the the issue with with bids capacity and and uncertainty is knowing if you're actually going to get anything in planning. I'd like to add to that point I've been making elsewhere is that sometimes the money comes out at almost no notice and it has to be spent within ridiculously tight timescales and uh, it, it's just not a good way for anyone to be doing business uh, and it's public money and we should be taking better care of it so net zero is a great target because you can measure you can measure your carbon emissions so we've all got together so why not give local government grants the accountability and competition can come from seeing how people have used them as Dan says we know our local communities so give everyone a grant to get started and then you'll see who does the best with it, and we can all learn from the lessons, both good and bad. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a round of three, and then we'll we'll sit down. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Blackburn, representing Utility Week magazine. I was just sort of picking up on um, Dan's comments about the house builders and their, you know, and and the difficulty persuading them to change the way they do things, which, interestingly, it's sort of, it's, Sounds like a bit of a theme I'm hearing on the, across the fringe. I've heard two separate MPs um, call for the building regu- the reform of building regulations to be accelerated to introduce zero carbon homes. Is that the kind of thing that we need to see to, to get this vitally important sector on, 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 onto the pitch? Thank you. Yeah, and there's one more at the back. Hello, James from Cooperatives UK. Uh, a question for Lord Callaghan, I suppose, maybe also for, um, for Councillor Watkins. Um, the extent to which government and policymakers see communities and cooperative action within communities as a potential enabler um, for retrofitting, uh, decarbonisation and wider behavioural change. If I could just give a, a quick example, there's a business in Manchester called Carbon Co-op, um, which drives take-up of retrofit services by providing trusted advice and support to households who join the cooperative Mm. and then by essentially bringing those households together and aggregating demand for retrofit services and then providing ongoing kind of support after retrofitting for those members and I wonder about whether that kind of cooperative and community-led approach needs to be one of the enablers that government thinks about. Okay Uh, Laura do you want to start us off on those Um, interested in your views on this debate we're having about the sort of you know grants versus bids and how local authorities fit into this? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I do think it's important for local authorities to have some horizon and actually in very similar ways to what we were talking about, uh, the Green Homes Grant, is actually build skills within the local authority and in the locality in terms of supply chain. And so actually having some longer term finance, some horizon, and also actually really I think central government behaving as a sort of conductor of an orchestra which actually starts to bring best practice from all sorts of parts of um, the country and I'm really actually very interested in what goes on in Manchester because I actually think they've done some really really excellent um, both planning, zoning and one of the very first things when we talk about heat is we're going to have to look at the country and not necessarily create um, absolutely tailor consumers options but there will be heating options which will be more appropriate in different parts of the country and I think we need to start to to think that through because that will actually start to build those supply Mm. chains in that particular set of technologies in those areas. Um, I do come back though to both the skills are great but unless we get the consumer protection right um, we will start to have a problem. There was a huge uh, retrofit um, energy efficiency program in Australia and it went extremely well for about four or five Mm -hmm. months. And then there was 
just three people who had a really bad experience and the whole program had to be shut down right so let's try and really understand the consumer journey and actually to be frank in my view um you know this but um we do need new people in the energy sector different sorts of people mm. who actually understand um that experience and that consumer um a journey and the retrofit thing will be the big moment of the truth no Caroline, do you want to pick up uh, sure um question from the councillor obviously something i get uh, a lot from from local authorities uh, i mean obviously most of your funding already is is is, is grant funded from mhclg these are you know, net zero top-up grants um i mean i have to operate under treasury rules uh, at the end of the day good value for for taxpayers money when we've got a limited pot of funding i have to get the maximum decarbonization efforts uh, under that funding and whilst I'm sure Kent is a brilliantly efficient uh, council under conservative control. It's not the case in every local authorities, and there are some shocking examples of, uh, of poorly designed and poorly planned schemes. So, I mean, we will be distributing some funding in the moment grant, but you know, I, I can't uh, mislead you that the, the majority of it will continue to be delivered on, the, on a competitive uh, basis so that we get the maximum bang for our taxpayers' money. That's there's, there's no other reason for that. Uh, but we are providing a lot of uh, technical assistance and help to, to local authorities to, to put together bids. Um, we've established a technical assistance facility run by the GLA to, to help with, with technical assessments and, and information. And also there are some series of regional energy hubs who are also available. Uh, precisely that is their job to provide help, assistance and guidance on councils to adjust the different pots of funding, whether it be public sector decarbonisation scheme, SHDF, LAD, etc., Apologies for all the acronyms. I'm trying to get the team to <laughs> simplify them, but uh, it's all addressing different parts of the market and, and different uh, systems. So, you know, we are there to try and help as, as much as possible, and I certainly put uh, put my officials uh, are always available to help local authorities mm -hmm. uh, as well. Please contact me if we can do any more. Um, but I can't pretend that I could just, you know, grant aid. You've got the local authorities. Uh, the Treasury will not allow it. <laughs> just, just on the point. Um, sorry. Go on. Yeah. I was just going to say on the point about the kind of long term sort of visibility of, yeah. of sort of funding and policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had the issue with the, the Green Homes Grant that was a very yeah. short time scale. Yeah. Is there a risk with the sort of spending review here as well that we get sort of stuck in these kind of two, three, four year time frames where actually we need to be thinking about what's the 10 year? Yeah. I, I, I mean, you won't find anybody in, in my department disagreeing with, uh, with, with that. Um, the treasury is the treasury <laughs> they they operate on a different time scale to everybody else uh you know i had uh, i had the job of trying to save the green homes grant scheme i wasn't responsible for the original design of it but i was responsible for trying to sort it out uh, afterwards i uh, spent a good part of my last year uh, grappling with the various difficulties and uh, there's a lot of lessons to learn from that but the first one and there's actually a very good national audit office report if you're interested which i thought was actually very fair I, um, I, I sat down with the inspectors and had a, had a long chat and ran through the various issues. Um, I think there's, a, there's a, firstly a problem of long-term credibility for precisely that reason, in that you know, the history of central government intervention in this space is a series of one-off mm. funding mechanisms. So you know, our reputation isn't stellarly brilliant with all the installers who say, well, why do we jump for this six months? Mm. Um, you know, we know what will happen here. We will put people on the road. We will uh, get guys employed, women employed. Uh, get the stuff done, then the grant will fall off a cliff uh, again. So I, you, know, you wouldn't find anybody in my department disagreeing with the need for long-term, consistent funding. And in retrospect, thinking that we could spend you know one and a half billion pounds in the middle of a pandemic um, in eight months was uh, probably ridiculously impractical. Uh, and as indeed it turned out, and then we designed a scheme which, in my view, was ridiculously over overly complicated for good reasons. You know you. The officials wanted to get, again, maximum decarbonisation for the money that was available, so they carefully designed the scheme to provide that. But in the process, you know, they're policy specialists, they do nothing else, they designed a scheme that wasn't really that accessible to most members of, of the public. And uh, and then under the tender process for the administrator, we, 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 we didn't perform particularly well in selecting the administrator, and all the problems then, then flowed uh, from that. And then, of course, the 
Treasury who's been urging us to do it as quickly as possible in the first place then said but you haven't done it quickly enough and therefore it's not working therefore we need to stop it so yeah it, it was it wasn't it wasn't our finest hour <laughs> but we're going to learn the lessons and I'm determined to learn the lessons for the clean heat grant and, and putting a huge amount of effort in to make sure that this operates much more smoothly and uh, and will be a much better consumer experience as you will discuss I'm just going to follow up on yeah that. <laughs> <laughs> um gentleman from uh, utility week with the building regulations that you know, building regulations responsibility of MHCLG decision has been made that 2025 is is new home standard part L of the regulations will be updated from uh, from next year I, I can't promise you that will change but there are reasons for that and it will uh, it is what it is um, community co cooperative action hugely enthusiastic for that uh, kind of thing great um, Want to enable such things as much as possible, like people, you know, joint purchasing decisions, mm -hmm. consumer cooperatives, etc. I, I think are great, um, and of course, it also fills a gap in the market, which I think is for trusted advice and support. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of cowboys, cowgirls in the uh, in the market at the moment who are providing lots of bad advice to people, and I get sent examples every other week of leaflets promising people free this and free that under whether it be the eco scheme or LED schemes or various other things uh, and consumers do find it quite confusing getting a source of independent impartial advice you know we do what we can we have simple energy agency we've got websites etc providing that advice but you know ultimately it is down to local companies local um, local trusted people trusted uh, uh, traders etc who will provide advice to to consumers people will uh, and I totally agree with Laura that we need to make sure that the consumer experience is good, uh, particularly in new and emerging technologies such as as heat pumps. Mm -hmm. If they start to get a bad reputation in the market, if Mrs. Jones installs one and it doesn't work for her, she tells 20 of her friends and posts on social media, etc., it will be disastrous for the rollout. Uh, similarly on heat networks, actually. Heat networks are... Um, relatively new in the UK we don't have a great tradition of them um, and there are some shocking examples of heat networks that have been installed uh, more or less as an afterthought by the developer um, and the developers have disappeared and left some uh, M&E company to look after it and it doesn't work and it's costing the people in the building a fortune and they often didn't realize what they were signing up to when they actually moved in they just moved into their bright shiny new flat how does the heating work oh there's some central boiler supplying it and you just get sent send a bill every month and there's no control over that bill. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to do two things on to drive our heat networks. We need to give local authorities the power to zone certain areas and there's some excellent examples of different mini inner city authorities that are looking looking at doing that now. And we need to provide a robust consumer protection framework. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're in one of those areas and you don't have a choice about using a particular heat network, mm -hmm. there needs to be robust price controls in place so that you're not getting heat ripped off. We'll be, and we will do that. Laurie, you want to come back? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. I'm really excited. I'm a little bit involved in Northern Ireland's energy strategy, and they are looking to develop one-stop <coughs> shops in every town over 5,000 people, which actually becomes a sort of green hub, stroke mm. advice centre, whatever, and actually creates independent advice. And in some ways, that then starts, they can triage all the different grant propositions they give you the accredited local suppliers who mm. have actually gone through certification and it actually becomes a, a point of reference and i think it's going to be quite an interesting little example and we could see how that works for a wider rollout but who's, who's responsible for doing that just out of interest uh, northern irish government okay because uh, one of the questions that's been bandied around a bit at this conference is whether we need a new sort of agency to think about this question of consumer protection whether yep. anyone at the moment yeah. in the landscape actually has the kind of I think the point on the, uh, <coughs> the community agencies is really, really important actually. Um, we have been working the last five years with a number of community agencies, so Community, community Energy South mm -hmm. uh, and a, a group uh, doing it called Hobby up in Scotland, uh, and a, a number of others actually on um, actually deploying um, uh, solutions to vulnerable customers who are in heat and fuel poverty. Um, you know, we've got a pretty straightforward you know, solution to that today at the Green Protect the Gas Grid 
would have wanted to in the market recently, you know, we need to kind of have another another look at that. But what we've learned from those agencies is that um, they're really well placed to actually identify which homes and which customers are the right people to go to to offer that that, that affordable and commercial uh, solution, and they can actually work with with companies like SGM, with local authorities, with regional government as well, to to actually kind of get the team together. So I think that's a kind of really um, really critical point to kind of make sure we keep that going going forward. Dan, if you pick up, I'm sure you might agree with some of Susan's points on the on the bids and the capacity mm-hmm. and so on. But also the other points around the, the role of uh, communities um, and, and potentially some more power that can be given to local, to local government. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I, I suppose um, when you think about how do people buy these energy efficiency solutions, you look at another sort of capital purchase industry, just cars. You know, you've got one model, which is for your high income people, they just buy a car outright. And then you've got maybe for more middle incomes, they do a higher purchase. And then for lower incomes, maybe they just rent. Um, and maybe that's, you know, to echo George's point, what we're kind of going to evolve <coughs> towards um, for the energy sector and, and whether, um, you know, Carbon Co-op, which I will look at when I get back home to Herne Bay, it's a very interesting model. Um, maybe that is one of those, you know, plays one of those models. And, and obviously co-ops and the same for a council, you know, we do communication to try and spread the word on, on how you can kind of green your life, if you like. And green your household um yeah that's that's all very helpful stuff and we just yeah. need you know there's the, the market needs to deliver but it's not just private enterprise it's co-ops it's councils and we can all experiment with these models and see see what works i think on the accelerated targets which um was it you know, utility um week we're asking about i mean if it'd be easy for me just to say yes <laughs> let's have accelerated targets but i'm a i'm a i'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur myself and i understand that you don't want to break the supply chain. So although I'm frustrated mm. that the larger suppliers, house builders, are moving seemingly quite slowly, I mean, but you've got people like Dacum, you know, all of our, all of our um, uh, lapels around our necks who are a medium-sized house builder, and they're doing everything net zero homes now. So you, you, I think a bit more pressure would be helpful for house builders, but you don't want to push them too hard because there are only so many trained engineers, and there are only so mm. many low carbon uh, fabrics and, and construction materials that we can we can home grow or build bring into the country so it's got to be done hand in hand really with with the de- with the developers i think my main worry and uh, appreciate not speak i'm not speaking to the right minister here necessarily but my main worry would be it's 2025 and we have this 80 percent um uh, efficiency uh, standard going into place but as i understand it if someone's given planning permission for development of new homes in 2024, they might not build that until 2027, and it would still be the original I today's building standards that apply. So, I mean, that was a point that's been made to Michael Gove in another session I was at earlier today, because we don't want to be wait- we want to have the same energy standards that we've got right now in six years' time, mm-hmm. and I think that's where maybe if we tighten up a little bit around that, that might be good because we can. Four years feels reasonable to, to, to switch a whole supply chain. I don't know that we need six years. Uh, I don't think I don't think the climate crisis can 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 wait that much longer either, frankly. Um, so there might be some some gains we can make there, and, and clearly uplift of Part L building standards and energy efficiency regs. In the meantime, is a is a helpful lever, isn't it, to to, to yeah. start taking us up to that yeah. to that standard. So we're going the right direction. Maybe a little bit faster would be my thought. And just quickly, that on the sort of capacity that local authorities have actually do all of this together both on a sort of official and at the ministerial level you know a lot of people talked about some of that's been sort of tucked away in the last decade or so do you feel like you've actually got the kind of expertise that you need to, to, to do this yeah we we um, were able to recruit a climate change officer very strong just before the pandemic and uh, any councillors who councils that don't have a, a strong person in that kind of role i think it's really important because it's not just planning it's every aspect of a council's operations that you, you want to st- start thinking about climate change and making making changes so um and our, and our planning team it's only a few people but i think i think they are you know in our case i'd say actually there is enough um expertise uh, but it's a cultural change for a council to think yes. climate change in everything it does um, and i think you need i would say i think you do need one person hope yeah to really be dedicated to that to that cause and <laughs> yeah he in this case is engages all the time with our planning department to just make them think everything that we do is about how can we strip out carbon from here and there 
um, to you know to gradually incrementally move move towards the, the target. But I do thank the minister also for tipping me off about the technical assistance facility, and I will be taking <laughs> that up with my officers this week. Contact okay. my department if you can't find it. It's in the GLA at the moment. All right, let, let's okay. have some more questions. I'll put those down front, the chap in the middle, and the chap at the back there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josie Thornwell. I'm actually the head of sustainability at Bacon, so I thank Councillor Dan oh. Watkins for the promotion there. <laughs> um, so uh, you did highlight the embodied carbon aspect as well, which is really important. I'm just going to flip your fact that you use around the 80%, and actually it then means that 20% of the homes that will be around in 2050 are yet to be built and therefore represent a huge opportunity. Um, and yes, you're right around the 2025 and the future home standard, that, that being quite confusing about those transition phases, which is why our commitment for 2025, we've made it really simple. If we're handing over a set of keys to someone in 2025, because this is about customer trust, as you said, quite right, Laura, um, that house will be zero carbon, both in operation, but also the production phase. So on that embodied carbon, 50% um, that you, you referenced, what might be done by the government in future strategies to encourage the operational carbon to be looked at alongside the embodied carbon? Okay. Really good question. In the middle there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cooper from Pandras District Council. Um, one thing I haven't heard, I've been to a few of these uh, meetings, fringe meetings uh, at this conference, and no one has mentioned this uh, thing that councils have been doing called the climate change emergency which uh, I find quite interesting. Uh, I also find it quite amusing because uh, uh, my council, uh, led by the Liberals and the Independents, declared a climate change emergency. And that was 18 months ago. And just, just to let you know, uh, EV spaces we put in, none. Uh, hydrogen stuff, none. Uh, house changes, none. In other words, 18 months, nothing's actually happened, but we've declared an emergency. But I have a slightly bigger problem with this. And that is the cost of this, because we're talking here at the moment about new houses, which is great, and certainly we will go in for that. But I'm thinking of the conversion. We've got 36,000 houses in Tandridge. If we're talking at £20,000 a time, that's £720 million in just a little area like Tandridge. And I really do wonder whether we might get upset and think about carbon neutral, I'm not sure our residents really do. Because if you ask them at the moment, the classic would be, I can't get any petrol. And that is their important view at the moment. And I really am not sure. I mean, I've been, as probably a lot of you have, I've been on the doorstep quite a lot of times, and no one has ever mentioned it to me on the doorstep. Okay. So I'm really concerned. I'm wondering about, are we taking this all too seriously without really taking the public with us? Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And I'll have a question at the back as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Naylor. I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the Windham Borough of Barking and Dagenham. Uh, but I'm also here in my capacity supporting the Thames Estuary Growth Board. Mm. Mm. Um, so, um, for, for full disclosure, my wife and I recently bought a Grade 1 listed house. It's powered by a gas-fired Arga. It's 30 years old. It's so catastrophically inefficient that I'm wholly expecting to be invited to COP26 as world leaders hold my household to account for our carbon <laughs> footprint. <laughs> uh, so, like, genuinely interested in, like, sorting this out because it's it would be cheaper to have a brazier burning 20 pound notes tomorrow so um <laughs> anyway uh, that's not my question <laughs> so, the, uh, so two quick points the first i think is just to make an obvious observation that we need a kind of networking networked and integrated response to this across sectors so transport yeah. industrial uses um house building it's why in the estuary we're taking this incredibly seriously because we think it's a very fertile place for this kind of technology development we're going to be launching our hydrogen strategy in November, I think, Kate, isn't it? Um, and we'll make sure that you all get a copy of it. Um, but I really wanted to pick up the point about government finance and, and a kind of more intervention stance when it comes to this. Because I think, certainly from our perspective, uh, the, the plea we're making to government colleagues is not to try and go about this in a kind of classic spending review way of creating a pot of cash, bidding into it, but rather for the stance of government to be that of kind of long-term patient capital investor seeing its job as kind of de-risking uh, a number of these propositions for the private sector, but on the basis that the UK PLC will get its money back in due course, as well as the benefits of things happening more quickly. It's quite, I think, as, uh, as the Minister was saying, that's quite a difficult thing to get across to Treasury. They kind of instinctively don't like seeing that as their role. 
But I think from our perspective, if you want that pace and scale, it's it's that kind of thinking that I think will unlock the kind of the magnitude of investment in the private sector that this 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 needs. Brilliant. So there's a question sort of in there as whether or not you know how we go about that, I suppose. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll ask you the private sector and then Sam start with you. Absolutely. I, I certainly won't try and directly answer the, the finance questions. I'm not qualified, but I, I certainly am um, welcome the work that the you know the Lur Thames Estuary Board is doing, and and we're feeding into that hydrogen strategy. It's going to be a regional story. Hydrogen, I suspect, you'll have a few hubs, um, and they will be able to help um, decarbonize industry uh, as you know as a sort of feedstock and cohesion. Um, and also, you know, play a big role in in, in uh, heavy transport, whether that be ships or in Kent, a lot of HGV vehicles, um, as you might imagine. So I think, you know, hydrogen has got 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 a role to play, and it's it's great there is some regional work going on. And I dare say, people like SGN are going to be very involved working with us on how do you how do you get the hydrogen from the from the factory, whether it be green or blue. Um, and I think we have to be open minded about it for the for this decade before it will switch to green eventually. How do you get it from there? To the end use segment, um, so that's, I think it's really exciting what's going on in in in, in hydrogen. Um, in terms of the, the embodied carbon a bit, I suppose actually ties back to that a little bit. I mean, if you think a lot, the majority of emissions for building a house uh, are to do with the concrete and the bricks, as almost some mentioned as I said before. Again, that comes back to the sort of heavy industry story. In in some ways, you know, we we can we can change building techniques to more wood. Um, wood frame buildings, which as I say, gets rid of some of those uh, energy intensive materials, but we can also just be using the same materials, but making factories which have had, you know, which have been green in, yeah. in, that, in, that, in that way. Um, we've just got to make sure we get the, the hydrogen to the right places and hydrogen will have use cases where it's very successful and, and you know, it's probably never going to make it in things like cars, <laughs> to be honest, but I think it's got a really important role um, to, to, to play and I, I'm, I'm very neutral about whether whether it, 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 how it might be used in residential housing as well to replace natural gas or whether it's heat pumps. It's horses for courses, isn't it? Depends what the local energy mix is and what infrastructure you've got to move hydrogen or low carbon electricity around. Just, just, to, just to be a bit more optimistic, my previous comment on the, the future home standard, I would just say uh, in Canterbury, we're going for essentially 100% so carbon free, life saving. So you know, we're telling our <coughs> in our local plan, we are saying that we are we are eventually saying, basically saying that all developers must be like you. So I if you want to be ambitious and bold, you can do it. But obviously, we're all aware that when the feasibility test is done, yeah, you know, we might get watered down. But uh, if, if you're passionate about you know climate emergency, sir, and, and and trying to fix the problem, I would encourage you to have a look at that. And when your local plan comes up. Um, think about bringing in a, a tougher standard than essentially their minimums aren't they that 2025 standard is a, is a, is a minimum so there's you know, things that can be done and finally just on the point from chat from um, Tambridge Council you calculate up the cost to whatever it was uh, many many millions of pounds but but remember what we were talking about with Laura and these new business models they will actually mean that no one has to pay a hundred million pounds in your example in because what will happen is the industry, you know, we've got a great financial services sector in this country. They will put the money in and we will hire purchase it or we will rent that, that technology. So, it, you, what, so, you know, think of a car. If you're buying a hundred million pound car, if that existed, you know, you, you, what you actually do is you just pay, you know, a fraction of that each, each month. And that might be the way the industry, energy industry goes. And because you make savings on your energy bill, I'm making savings from my, my, my heat pump. You know, it's, it's better value than gas. So I think actually <coughs> we can square this circle and not ask uh, consumers to take on huge upfront costs if we get a good consumer proposition with good, uh, good finance behind it. I think the, the other point is just the costs are going to come down for each installation and you know, what we're hoping I'd is... I'd like to take the flag that that cover the installation costs yeah. of all the equipment. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I think that if you look at the, the Climate Change Commission, for example, their modelling is based on those costs falling quite a lot to around sort of 10,000 per household. I think. And thanks, Dan. Uh, Josh, do you want to come in on any of those, those questions? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think some of those points actually, um, Councillor Cooper and Chris, I think actually we kind of touched on a little bit, you know, around the, how, how we actually finance some of this stuff. You know, th those customers that have the, the money that, that is there and they're, they're ready to go into the market and, and put a lot of capital down, 
wider interstate, you get hired there by uh, Heathrow or any other technology, and I think that you know that, that's probably few and far, be, far between. And, and it's certainly in terms of, of domestic heat, you know, we have we have to kind of switch people's mindsets from you know very few people say to their partner at the weekend, oh, why don't we go out and buy a boiler just because they they fancy it. It, 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 it's a distressed purchase that you do uh, when your boiler. Some geeks do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, so, and, and when we kind of talk about the volumes at stake, we've got to find a proposition where the customer is expected that experience that customers have, the control they have over their heating, that that actually works for them in terms of the, the financing piece, piece as well. And I think here's where that that model around patient capital that actually we, we've built really well in the UK, whether it's in energy infrastructure, in airports, you know, I, I think actually we've got to kind of work out how that plays a bigger role in, in this sector, such that we don't, you know, put that proposition in front of customers that says, it's going to cost five grand now, and by the way, you need another 10 grand for, you know, for, for further up, upgrades. I think at that point, you know, you, you go and knock on 25 million doors, doors get closed mm -hmm. because people want to carry on watching, you know, Nathan Street or whatever it might be. So, so I'm, being, you know, I'm being slightly flippant, but, but that, that I think is a fundamental point around how we get this right and, and make sure that customers don't see that, that increase in cost on their day-to-day on their -day bill. Because yeah, we can model it and say, well, actually, over a period of time, X technology will, will reduce your bills. But ultimately, I think most people are thinking, I'll just come out of my salary this month, and, you know, and what have I got at the end of it? So if that goes from, say, you know, hundred pounds to three hundred, that that's you know that's really going to be a problem. But I do think we've got the experience within uh, you know regulated industries in the UK within the finance sector, as Dan Dan mentioned, to actually come up with you know, a novel financing approach that says over a period of time, customers we can you know, get this purchase done now and 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 actually get that get that paid off again. Are you a fan of some of the sort of ideas that have, have come around around the sort of green greening stamp duty or something like that to try and encourage people at the point of sale to make yeah. some of these changes when perhaps that's a moment where they might be thinking about doing something about it? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's the right thing. You know, if you can get a cheaper mortgage because you've got a more energy efficient home, then whatever the technology, whether it's whether it's electrification or whether it's fighting or, or buy a new plane, that sounds like a pretty sensible thing thing to me. I think one of the things, you know, there's a bit of a lot of discussion around should we shift uh, the way we've got electricity bills onto gas? You know, th that that feels like it's kind of not a bad idea. If you kind of dig under it a little bit, then there are there are possibly lots of loses in that 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 space as well. Personally, I think that you know something that looks at the customer perspective and puts an obligation on suppliers, say, to start buying uh, zero carbon heat, you know, you know, particular technology actually sort of changes the, the model on that, and, and maybe that's a way rather than kind of you know. We've got to rather kind of find a way between one or two customers not to frustrate or actually challenge them to somehow fund it through mm. through the tax system, which I can imagine what the response might be, certainly in the next, <laughs> next couple of years. Sure, sure. Oh, Callanan, I saw you nodding at the, the mention of the many climate emergencies being declared. Um, so I wanted to comment on that. And also this point around sort of networks and integrated plans in different sectors. Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I, I totally agree with you, sir. I mean, it's kind of politics I hate is gesture politics you know we we declared a climate emergency you know gin and tonics all around let's have another let's have another kind of drink you know the, the twitterization of politics isn't it you know I've, I've tweeted my outrage and created a hashtag job done it is, I think you know I, I, what I think is good about about the conservative party is we're interested in practical solutions what works what you know, taking people with us on the on on the journey and influencing behavior not you know impossibilist solutions that you know extinction rebellion and the left and everything come up with you know the idea that you can ban people from flying and you can take their cars off them and you know march into their house as a government inspector and rip their gas boiler i mean yeah th let's live in the real world about what's practically deliverable in a democratic society where people you know if they don't like something they'll vote against it they can object somebody will put forward the proposition probably the liberal democrats actually of, uh, of them of them objecting to it and uh, you know i Declaring a climate emergency, you know, whoop it you do. Uh, let's. What, what's your solution? What's your practical solution to dealing with these really difficult uh, issues? So, totally agree with you. Um, you know, we need to provide people with the right incentives, take them on a road. I mean, to take an example of it, I've got. I'm also responsible for smart metering, and I've got a lot of big energy companies coming in now because we you know we have an obligate. They have an obligation to roll out smart metering, and I think they're a great thing, and uh, we 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 have to deliver on that. 
And so they're now coming and saying, well, we need to make it compulsory. I can't think of anything worse, to be frank, than the government passing a regulation saying you have to have a smart meter. And people would take the barricades, object right to their MPs and everything. The idea that the government could march into their home and install a smart meter by force is, is, is not living in the real world. We need to provide people with the right incentives. Companies come out with innovative tariffs that will enable them to take advantage of them, etc. Is, in my view, just seems to be instinctively going with the grain of, of British uh, public opinion and psychology. Your point about uh, embodied carbon, of course, is good, and I, I don't have much to add. What Dan had to say, I think he answered it very well. A lot of good modular homes um, coming out now, some incredible advances of factory built stuff, and decarbonizing the, the hard cement sector, the, uh, the, the steel, brick, etc., cetera, which, which we can do, will, will hopefully provide an answer to that. Um, the gentleman from um, Barking and Dagenham, I thought, made some good points. Um, you know, I wish government finance operated differently, but it doesn't. The Treasury is what the Treasury is. And uh, you know, the government made a long-term investment. We're trying to do that to a certain extent through the likes of the Infrastructure Bank um, and you know, the provision of long-term finance. Uh, currently engaged in trying to persuade them to, <laughs> to, to allow um, smaller scale uh, projects such as such as um, decarbonisation to be funded by that and proving a bit of an uphill struggle at the moment. But you know, we do need to look at innovative forms of, of green finance and uh, you know, when to make the right interventions. And you know, there's no question that owner occupiers are going to be the most politically difficult uh, aspect to, to tackle. And um, you know, I'm given lots of good ideas and good proposals from the various think tank communities but an awful lot of them seem to be quite politically controversial uh, to me which uh, will probably get my post bag buzzing from members of parliament <laughs> <laughs> very good uh laura do you want to come in on yes on no i mean absolutely love what you're doing in gateway and all of that work and i always say you know hi um hydrogen is sort of like the heineken of its way it's just as parts other deep paths can't reach <laughs> and I think that that's really really important but it does actually allow for you to have um, a lot more choices actually in the area about your heat vector your transport options etc and this is comes back down to um, this the problem of the silos in which we all sit and you know Martin has to navigate the silos in government etc but actually what that's where these local, um, whether it be the Thames Gateway, whether it be Manchester um, as a sort of you know local authority, can actually start to blend those solutions. And that's where you get the optimization, that's where you get the cost reduction, and that's where you can get some of this rollout. So if you've got streets that are going to be decarbonized in whatever way, you can actually coordinate that and start to get cost reduction because you're going down a street rather than going to individual homes. So there is a coordination role, and I think it's super important what local authorities should and could and should be supported to do because I think they're part of the deployment um, solution. On the issue of um, the so-called um, boilers and the homeowners' um, homes, in the 30-year period between now and 2050, you'll probably have two to three times boiler um, replacement. And you might have probably two reasonable-sized restoration events over that house's period. Um, over those, at those points, and I think that you know, you're know you absolutely right about this point of sale, is a really, really important point. And I think whether it be a stamp duty, whether it be a sale obligation, that is the moment by which disruption is not disruption, it's renew. At the moment, I do not want somebody coming into my home and disrupting any of it, by the way. And also, I would urge the energy sector to start to meet some interior designers. Because, I mean, have you seen a heat pump recently? Right? It looks disgusting. Um, so you've got the ugliness. I mean, so why do people not buy G Wheels cars? And they all bought Teslas. So I, I really think this whole issue about us moving into human space rather than offshore space needs a very different skill set. And it's not just skills of plumbers, it needs communications, it needs business models. 
And Martin was saying that there are financial services com companies coming into the energy sector to unlock some of these decarb assets. The problem is, is that the regulation doesn't allow my energy supplier to be a financial service supplier. And so I think there is something that does need to be unpicked around the regulatory model that makes the good choice, to be frank, the easy choice rather than the super. Uh, Dan's experience sounds like a, it sounds like a sitcom. Even. <laughs> Very bad. Um, so lots of opportunities. Brilliant, thank you. And no solutions, I'm afraid, for your gas guzzling ardor, Chris, but uh, another another day. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. I promised my panel we'd finish by 10 too. Sorry I didn't manage to get everyone's questions in. Um, do check out the Institute for Government website if you want to see our analysis of this. We'll be responding to government's net zero strategy and other things. Do watch out for Lord Callanan's heat and building strategy. When are we expecting that? Coming, coming Shortly. Weeks? Shortly. There we go. Um, uh, and all that remains is for me to say thank you very much to our sponsor, SDN. Uh, thank you to you for your great questions and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Great cheering.